Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it's great that we have uh, Professor Junaid Sadar uh, with us today. He's going to present uh, uh, the challenges of underwater robot deployment in the field from ideas to implementations. Uh, Junaid uh, received uh, his PhD from McGill and he had um, a postdoc uh, appointment at the University of British Columbia. And uh, also he was assistant professor at Clarkson before he joined the University of Minnesota. He's uh, in charge of the interactive robotics and vision laboratory. And we're very glad to have him with us as a colleague. Thank so you. Today, very kind of you to say that, sir. The podium is yours. Oops. The audience is a little jittery today. Um, yeah, I think theoretically so. Okay. Um, and am I being transmitting? Am I transmitting right? Yeah, yep. Can you hear me in the mic? Yep. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, welcome to the, those here and those on the TV, I guess I should say, like the late night hosts. Um, seems like that a little bit. But, okay. So, as Nico said, my name is Junaid. I'm an assistant professor at uh, computer science and engineering. I also have a presence here at the Minri. And um, yeah, so what I do is broadly classified as field robotics. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you take robots in a cornfield or in a soccer field for that matter. But field robotics in general talks about where you cannot control the environment that the robot is running in. So places like this, right? We can instrument the world. We can put markers on the floor. We can have different colored walls and, and things like that. The um, advantage is just there is that depending on your application, you can set up the world so that robots have it easy or relatively easier problems to solve. In my kind of work, we're working in environments like these, right? So the modern nature has ultimate say on what works and what doesn't. And specifically in my case, I'm doing field robotics in a very narrow perspective, or not narrow perspective, but in a broad perspective actually, but the focus is on underwater human robot collaboration. So it's robots and humans working together underwater and they have to understand each other and then get things done safely. That's the important bit that I want to kind of stress on. All right, so um, we haven't missed much. So this is the lab, uh, the interactive robotics and vision lab that I started. Our focus is on um, autonomous robotics. We do want to have autonomy in place. Um, we also like humans because they are our students and also they do work with robots. Um, the key point there is actually the robot autonomy is great, but we don't have robots that can actually autonomously do things fully and also safely these days. Uh, case in point, self-driving cars, right? You can see how many bad things happen in those that front already. We're interested in robot vision um, because or really I like vision and also because vision is one of those um, passive sensors. It doesn't emit anything, unlike a sonar or, or a LIDAR sensor. This is passive and I'll tell you why this is useful underwater specifically. An application theory outside of underwater, we've looked at robots in healthcare and I have looked at robots in healthcare and also in autonomous driving. The key point to take away from that paragraph is the underwater robot, uh, the underwater environment is a challenging scenario for perception, for locomotion, for interaction. Whatever lessons we learn there can be actually ported to problems elsewhere. So the self-driving, it's not self-driving, it's more like assistive driving work that we've done. I'm not gonna talk about it now, um, but it looks at driving in snowy slash bad visibility scenarios where you may not be able to see the lanes on a road. And that lesson has been learned from working in underwater domains. Um, and in the field, we look at human robot collaborations where people are working with robots in unstructured, uncontrolled environments. So that's one uh, of snapshot from us pre-COVID. This is 2019 summer. Uh, this is not a joy, right? Actually, we're going to a field deployment in the middle of Lake Minnetonka um, up there. And uh, Cole is an underwater, well, he's a master student now uh, in math, but you know, students in the bank. Um, and these are a bunch of the grad students that I've had the pleasure of working with in the last few years. And we'll see their work as we get along. Um, Jahid, who's on the left, is actually becoming a professor himself in Florida. He picked a right spot for field robotics. All right, so why do we do robots underwater? Because there's lots of applications. So this is a prototype of our robot, which is now called Local. At the time, it was called Edgebot. Um, we built this thing in-house, and it's actually in room 150 right now. So if anybody just walks by room 150, you'll see this thing on the bench. 
uh, this is a low cost open source underwater robot. That's where the local name comes from. So low cost open, those are the LOCOs. And um, we like to use these low cost robots either individually or um, in a group to do things like environmental monitoring, right? What is happening with the water quality? What is happening with coral reefs, for example? Or even looking at trash deposits in the water. Search and rescue comes to mind. Like you've all heard about the Boeing crashes um, and other plane crashes or the shipwrecks that happen. You want to go not maybe, it might be too late for people to be, served, uh, to be rescued, unfortunately, but there are important telemetry information that you might need to, to extract. Uh, lots of un underwater infrastructure, pipelines, gas lines, oil lines, um, rigs, and now data centers even. Microsoft has data centers underwater. You want to inspect those things. Security has its perspective, surveillance as well, and obviously that's a more military security perspective. But the most important thing here is that this is not an environment for us. Uh, we are not supposed to be staying underwater for hours at once. Right now we are doing that, as in people are doing that because robots are not capable to handle these issues that we need to handle. So talking about the plane crashes, these are slides that I've stolen from um, the PBS Frontline episode called uh, Boeing's Fatal Flaw. And this is not a Boeing crash slide. Uh, this is, however, real footage from Indonesia after the 737 MAX 8, the Lion Air 737 MAX 8 crashed off the Sea of Bali, uh, of Java Island, I think. So divers being deployed to look for the black boxes. Divers looking at the wreckage of the plane right here. This is deployment. That's what underwater scenarios look like. So this is what we're talking about. This is what we want to work in. That person right there has to have a robot next to him as an assistant helping him out do things. Look close at home, right here in Minnesota. That um, plant that you're looking at is called the Eurasian water milfoil. It's not native here, it's invasive. And it grows and it rots and it dies and it really does a number on the local um, native species of plants and, and fish that should thrive in the lakes and they don't. Especially in around this time of the year, right before it freezes off, it actually rots badly and gives out a bad stink. And it makes it difficult for the fish and other plant life to get the nutrition that it needs. Where is this? Pretty much half the state, right? And uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources or the DNR as we call it, or they're actually called the Natural Resources Department right now, but we still call them DNR. They have manned missions, divers go in there one at a time to look for these growths and the roots of these trees and these plants and they have to yank them out or there's an element called D24-8, which they deploy. It's a, it's a herbicide. Uh, it's some kind of a chemical, essentially poison, just throughout the whole lake. And you cannot go in the water for seven, eight, nine days at a time. And it kills more than the mirror, this erosion milfoil, right? So what are we trying to do here? What could be done here? We could have a robot that recognizes these species and separates these species from other species of plants. And then targeted deployment of herbicide might actually take care of them. That would be much easier. Right now, covering one large lake, like if you have ever seen, those of you who are from Minnesota, you've seen them obviously, but just go to, let's not even Lake Superior, go to, you no, know, Minlac. It's an ocean. It looks like an ocean to you. You cannot cover a lake like that with one diver in 10,000 years, right? That's just not going to happen. So we need to address these problems at scale. That's an example of underwater um, ecosystem preservation. Um, this is a footage from, 1990, from the Sea of Japan. Look at the number of plastic bags and bottles and trash that's deposited there. So that thing on the right that you're looking at is a remotely operated vehicle by this agency called JAMSTEC, the Japanese Agency for Marine Art Sciences and Technology. And they've been collecting the data for the last 30 years um, for purposes that I don't know, but we found them online, they're available. And we said, hey, could we use them for um, something that robots could do, meaning, can we have camera operated camera equipped robots looking at scenes like this and recognize what's trash and what's not, then eventually clean them up. So we actually took this data and created a data set called Trash Can. It's, it's uh, freely available on um, what's called Drum, not in a physical Drum, it's a data repository of the University of Minnesota, DRUM. And you can go and download systematically labeled and bounding box images of um, trash of three different kinds of different categories of trash on which you can train your favorite deep detector model if you're so interested and figure out what you can do to find trash better. Because that's not trash, or maybe it is. I don't know, does it look like a crab? 
even I can tell, right? What would your robot understand? So this is a challenging scenario where your standard cat versus dog detector is not going to work, right? So deep learning has its limits. Look at that fish that just swam right by. You don't want that fish to be extracted. You want that underwater crash that's getting deposited. You want those things to be cleaned up. So I'm laying the groundwork right now with some of the work that we've been doing. But the point of this talk is actually not to talk about the theoretical aspect of this work, but how do you get to make your robots work in environments like these? How do you get to use the data that you see there so that your robots can understand better, maneuver better, work with humans better? And how do you validate that what you've done in the labs or through human studies or through benchmarking on you know, COCO for that matter? Will this really work in a robot in a real world scenario? That's the point that I'm going to make here. And that's just want to make sure that you understand the kind of work that we do. So when you're talking about collaboration, this is what I'm talking about. So that's me actually using basically nothing but my hands to work with the Minibot. This is a six legged vehicle. It's of the family of the Aqua robots. And it understands hand gestures to some extent. And I said to some extent because it is very preliminary gestures as in you can use gestures like this to that to different combination of your fingers, both hands. Uh, it doesn't understand full blown gestures yet where you can say go right, go left. That is being worked on. Um, but this is a very convenient way of operating, quote unquote, um, operating a robot body because you don't need a remote control. You don't have wires. You have nothing else but your hands. And this is important because underwater, you cannot have wireless communication. You can, but it's really low bandwidth. Attenuation is high the signal degrades. Oh, that's not me. Okay, thank goodness. That's my phone because the ringtone is the same. All right. Um, I've, um, so, so these things don't really always work often don't work. And therefore we have to come up with non uh, electromagnetic band methods of communication. So flashing lights or audio or hand gestures. So on the alternative to this robot human direct communication is you can teleoperate with a remote control with a cable going underwater. Or you can just pre-program and then drop the robot and the robot's gonna do some script, right? Just run it. Or interactive deployment like that. So our goal is to do mostly this because then you know what the robot's doing. The robot has the ability to understand what you're trying to tell it and what you're doing. And then everybody's kind of happy and collaborative in that manner. Teleoperation looks like that. Um, these are actual photos from actual teleoperation processes that I've been a part of. I'm actually right there in that boat in the middle of a rainstorm in the Caribbean Ocean, I'm sorry, in the Caribbean Sea. Um, and we're deploying a robot and I'm basically wearing my swimming trunks and nothing else. And it's the Caribbean with 90 degrees Fahrenheit temperature, yes, but it's pelting rain drops like this big. And I'm trying to cover my laptop so that it doesn't get wet and praying to God, so please do not make this lithium battery blow up on my face if it short circuits. That's a challenge. This is a different kind of challenge where my colleague Philippe, he's a professor also right now. It's so bright and sunny that he can't even look at the screen. So he took his own shirt off and uses that as a sunscreen essentially to see the screen on, on, the, on the computer that it's operating on. But most importantly, look at the logistics. There's a whole boat right there. There's cables, there are um, pelican cages, there are swimming gear and all that. Um, electronics and water don't mix well together, generally speaking. So we try to separate those two things, right? If you want to teleoperate, you need to have this sort of logistical support. Um, not always easy. So this is called the operator in the loop because there's an operator under that canopy right there. If you can make uh, that person, it, they're right there with a, with a tarp around it. They're trying to run the robot while the, ro the boat is bobbing up and down. And it creates a lot of points of failure, lots of points of um, problem. Um, it creates a complication in the interaction loop. And you don't know what's going on underwater because you're, you're looking at this tiny screen with the joystick and they don't know what you're doing. They mean the divers in the water. They don't know what you're doing. So they're very confused. So there's a big disconnect between actual divers with the robot versus the teleoperator who's on a boat. So you don't want those sort of problems to happen too often. So what are we going at then? This is an application again. This is, I think, from 2012 or 13. Um, this robot is being operated with a set of tags, not hand gestures. This is pre previous work. And it's doing what's known as a, a transect. So it swims right over coral reef back and forth, but it's taking commands from the diver. Here, we're doing three dimensional reconstruction of this coral, um, not the coral, sorry, the shipwreck. It's called the Pamir. It was, I think, sunk in the 1940s. Uh, I'm not sure what the cause of the sinking was, but the robot is going around the boat 
uh, the shipwreck and creating, um, collecting stereo imagery so that we can create a three-dimensional model of the robot later on. Um, what's the point of this? Please note, the robot has no external tethers attached to it. All it knows is what it's being told through those tags. So communication, no remote control, but direct interaction with the diver. And even here, there is no tether, nothing whatsoever. So if you make a mistake in programming the robot, if the robot mal malfunctions, it will end up in a place you'll never see it before. So let that sink in, like literally and figuratively. Underwater robotics, if it fails, your robot may not ever see your face again. Unlike a drone, you'll see it in pieces, yes, which is not ideal either, but in this case, your robot's gone forever. And I know colleagues who have lost their robots and these things are expensive. Can somebody guess that little tiny robot that's swimming out there, what the price point for that is? Just make a crazy guess if you can. 100,000. That is an amphibious robot, it can also walk. So 40K would have been uh, like a minor heart attack. 100K is probably like sheer death. So we lost this robot once in Lake Nokomis for about five minutes because I thought my students had it, my students thought I had it. And then we're looking at each other like, where is the robot? And sheer panic. You can see my expressions right now because I have a mask on, but it was like sheer horror at this point in time. The way I found it was I stepped on it. And that was sheer luck as well because it's red. And if you have anyone's been in a lake in Minnesota, anywhere in the summer, the water quality is like this. So I blend right in, I'm invisible in the water. So is this guy and you can really find it. So that's the real risk we're running, right? So the risk of failure is extremely high. Challenges we are facing other than those, right? Again, from the same documentary, is anybody a scuba diver in this mess? Nobody, okay. Then I'll point this out. Look at how many tanks this guy has, three. That's a three tank dive, that's extremely rare. That means you're supposed to be down there uh, 45 minutes approximately with one tank, depending on how deep you go. The deeper you go, the more oxygen you consume. So three tank dive on about 45 to 60 feet depth will take you about, um, let me see, that's 45 times three. So roughly two hours and 20 minutes-ish or 15 minutes-ish. That's how long you can sustain in the water. Uh, two hours and 15 minutes, even in the tropics underwater is going to get you cold and numb. And you don't want to stay down there because your senses go numb and you might make mistakes because all as you're diving, this gentleman has a dive watch, pressure sensor, altimeters, and all that stuff. He has to monitor all those things. And the other thing you also have to realize, you can just shoot up from 60 feet to zero because if you decompress that fast, what happens with the Coke bottle will happen to you, except you're not a Coke bottle. And in a Coke bottle, it's, it's carbon dioxide. In your case, it's nitrogen. The deeper you get, it gets compressed into your bloodstream. And then if you suddenly come up quickly, it evaporates, it just bubbles right out and then goes to your joints and your eyeballs and your ears. I'm gonna make it really attractive right now. They will rupture. This is called the bends because it's so painful. And so you, you just essentially bend into these deformable shapes, not what you want. This is why we don't want people down there. My robot can come up in 30 seconds from hundred feet. That's okay, don't care. It doesn't have joints, doesn't have nitrogen mixed into it. It's, it's okay, it can handle it. We cannot. So even if an emergency, you have to go every nine to 10 feet, stabilize, pressurizes, equalize as we call it. So hold your nose, okay, nine feet again, nine feet again. That's what they teach you. But obviously when you actually go and do it for a while, you play with the rules a little bit. You shouldn't because this is a bit dangerous, but I've seen people do it at 15 or more uh, because they think oh, I'm fine. Maybe in later life, they're all like bent backwards. I don't know, but that shouldn't be happening. So visibility is bad. There is no signal um, in the EM band, no speech, no Wi-Fi, no radio, no GPS. The robot is, by the way, all enclosed, right? As I said, electronics and water do not mix together. So you have to make it really, really watertight. One missing screw, you are screwed, which is not what you want to happen, right? Also, all of this is happening while the diver is trying to figure out where is the freaking black box. That's his job, that's what he's down there. Now, if you tell him that, oh, this is how you have to press this button, press that button, and then I'll swipe right and swipe left, and this is how you can operate your robot. Nobody's going to use a robot, just ne never. That's not gonna happen. So this is why we are called the IRV lab because we're looking vision, robotics, and this interactivity. All of these things have to seamlessly interact and mix. Otherwise, so we're gonna do something really well and the rest of it is not going to work out at all. 
So our approach has been, just to briefly speaking, we've been looking at improving visibility in environments where it's quite degraded. Um, underwater is like that. We're doing both visual and bi-directional human robot communication. So hand gestures and versus robot gestures as well to understand what the robot's trying to do. And also robot state estimation and scene understanding in environments like these um, with semantic segmentation, uh, sparse, um, well, SLAM, which is localization and mapping in sparse featured environments and visual odometry. So we've done a fair amount of work in that space. So if you're interested, as I said, I'm not gonna be covering all of this today and none of this as a matter of fact. The lab URL is at the end, please go and take a look at it. But this is our bow and arrow of tools. So vision has been our two go method, both feature-based and deep learning. I mean, you can't not do that these days. Uh, also generative machine learning, and we'll talk about that briefly. Um, we're using probabilistic reasoning for state estimation, but all of this plugs into an interactive protocol where we actually put the humans first. So it's not an afterthought to make a robot and then make these robots and humans work together. Uh, we design our protocols based on the fact that yes, there will be a human in the loop. Um, and so there's work on robot localization using human limbs, like human joints, like your shoulder joints and knee joints. Robots can look at that and basically understand where you are and where they are with respect to you. Uh, so we exploit the humans. That's actually a bad thing to say. That's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say is we are actually using the humans for robot localization and robot state estimation. And we want to focus here today, what it takes to do this field validations on physical AV platforms. Um, the, the, the thing that separates us, I think, from many theoretic, theoretical vision groups or more traditional robotics groups is that we go from crazy conceptualized idea to prototyping, to implementation, to bench testing, to robot testing, to pool testing, then all the way down to lakes and rivers. So we do the whole spectrum. Not everybody, every member in the lab is involved in the whole spectrum, but one of the things we've learned very quickly, and I've learned very quickly as a grad student that doing robots or doing application oriented robotics in the fields where they matter, where they're going to run in the first place, makes your work so much better and makes your work so much more effective than just coming up with a simulated environment or some theoretical benchmark testing where you might get good results, but they will not translate into good operating behaviors. So that's the practice that we've been running around in this lab with. So just briefly talking about this vision working underwater, this is common to see in, if you have a GoPro, you go underwater, those sort of things you'll see, not the robot maybe usually, but you know, green haze and tint and everything. This is what you'll be looking at. What we want to see are things like that. Like you can barely tell the robot is red on the top photo, but on the bottom photo, yeah, colors are a lot more vibrant, right? So how are we doing this? We're doing this with methods from the generative adversarial network world. What's the idea? The idea is imagine there is no water. How would that world look like? Um, hopefully we don't have to see that. But if we want to learn that if we remove the water from this, we can get to that, that's really hard because there is no example of a coral reef in Dubai on the land because that doesn't exist. So we did some creative thinking, essentially taking some nice pictures underwater from different data sets or things that we collected. And then we learned with this thing called again, it's a generative adversarial network, meaning one network trying to fool the other network saying, no, hey, this is a great image. And the other network says, nope, it's not. So the previous network goes back to the drawing board, trying to make a better photo and tries desperately to fool the other guy. And this is what we call in computer science, a minimax game. And the generator, which is the one creating the image will only succeed if it can fool this discriminator, the one that's actually trying to check if it's real versus fake consistently onwards. So when that's done, then we say, okay, the generator is good enough that it can take an image, forward pass, generate a clear image, good enough for the discriminator to understand that that doesn't look fake. Very common method. You've seen these things happen in like, NVIDIA. They've got some lots of media with fake faces and deep fakes and all that stuff. Unfortunately, those are generative models. I mean, not unfortunately, but it's a bad use of these uh, generative models. What we're doing is we're taking a crappy video like that and enhancing them as much as we can to make videos look like this. Now, I won't go through the whole um, uh, fleet of these algorithms that we have. One of our newest and I should say one of the greatest things that we have given, you know, latest and greatest things we've done is something that we call ACSR. So we're doing both super resolution and enhancement at the same time. So a simultaneous enhancement and super resolution, henceforth the name ACSR. So you're providing images that look like that. 
then it does enhancement it finds salient features and points and then it does super resolution meaning it zooms it up without losing image quality and degradation so um these are some of these footages are from us so that's one of our students actually your ta that's mike mike fulton right there um i don't know what he's trying to do oh he's trying to capture a fish i think with on the on the um, on the sensor that he has in his hand um but the the one network that we have here does three things at the same time it does um, enhancement, salient area detection, and then super resolution. Again, all of this, by the way, as a, as a quick note, this is all available for free in the code that is, and the papers. So if anybody's interested in running these things, just go to our lab website, you'll find our, find our GitHub, um, and you can download and play with these things as much as you want, right? So everything we do, almost everything we do, minus one thing that we have done, I haven't released the code for that one, everything else has been openly released for um, research and educational purposes. They're GPL essentially, um, so open source licenses, including our robot, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, so now is the point where this might have frozen, which is what I don't like. Maybe I can try to move this. Okay, there you go. So when we're doing underwater H human robot interaction or collaboration, what we mean is robots and humans close proximity. Um, this is from our last um, ocean trials in 2020 after which we haven't had one thanks to covid um so one of our undergrads came she held on to the robot where the robot was instructed to go to a certain point and it's carrying him carrying her there so that's that powerful it can drag a whole human being from point a to point b for a while of course at the expense of battery power i'm sorry i should just move out of the way a bit um interaction is a component of collaboration meaning you're trying to talk to the robot robots doing something but this talking back and forth part is what we call interaction collaboration is a superset of what you can do with the robots. Unfortunately, in the field, there are different kinds of robots that you're dealing with. So that all these photos are from different kinds of robots that I've had the opportunity to work with. So um, as Nikos was mentioning, I was in Clarkson University in upstate New York, um, close to the Adirondack. So that's there, a husky in the snow got stuck in the mud and then the motor got destroyed. And then we're trying to figure out what the heck to do about it. Uh, people who have worked with huskies, you guys know, um, it's a great platform, but it's also a finicky platform at times. Uh, Mike is trying to get Loco together, and then he's trying to interact with Minibot in, the bar in Barbados. And this is actually a drone footage. So the drone's looking down at me, and I'm trying to do hand gestures to the drone, and it's not working. And the students, Jumsok and Jahid, are really amused that it's not working because at the expense of the supervisor, they're very happy about it, which is how things go. But to get this stuff working, for example, um, if you want to understand who's who underwater, it's a process in computer vision called re-identification re-ID, you need to know that in one robot's camera, this person who's labeled as ID1 is the next person that I see in the other camera as ID1. You have to have a correspondence. I won't go into the details of the algorithm right now. This is again the robot to robot localization paper that talks about how we do this using human body pose and the way they're oriented. The point I'm going to make is how did I get this data? This is how we got that work done, right? So this is about at 40 feet of water depth. So that's the three of us. I'm robot two is me. Um, robot one is Mike Fulton. Robot three is Jung So Kong. He's, these guys are fifth year PhD students now. And these humans that you see marked over there are our volunteers who we basically didn't even buy lunch for, but they said, sure, for the sake of science, we'll help you guys. So we're doing this in the middle of the ocean, essentially, um, not too far off the beach, as you can see there are coral reefs in the background. Um, and three of us, I have a robot, Mike has a robot, Jukesung has a GoPro camera, and we're collecting data. So this is one of the reasons you go out to the field. That is A, obviously validate everything, but also you can be in the field. I mean, I would love to be there right now. I'm not, right? So I, Minnesota doesn't have a beach like that, especially now. So what do we do? You collect as much data as you can. So in the off season, you can do your research offline. Right? So you have to come back and do this later on. Um, key names are an interesting proposition. And this is another example that I'll show you. Um, it's a word that we found to indicate motion related linguistic structure. So hand gesture, like a unit, like no, that way, or that way, or I don't know, right? This is, this is an example of a key name. So we've used key names for robot to robot communication, robot to human communication. Uh, so this is Mike Fulton's original work, actually it's almost his thesis. So this is in simulation. The robot's bobbing its head, meaning yes, this is no, uh, and then this is a maybe, like, you know, it's sort of human-like, right? Yeah, maybe. 
uh, let's ascend meaning I'm trying to go up. Let's descend means it wants to go down, right? This is in simulation because the real story behind this is, A, it was easy to do. And this is Unreal Engine, this 3D graphics that you're looking at. And B, the robot broke. So we didn't have an actual robot to work with. So we did the initial work in simulation. Then we went in the ocean. And um, the ocean environment, if I can move there, uh-oh. I can't move there for some reason. Um, I can stop the presentation and read on this. I'm not sure if your screen share is going to go away. Okay, so if you're giving me the clearance, then I shall do that. Um, my apologies. But, okay, yeah, I know I closed the screen share. Um, let me find the part that I'm looking for. Okay, so when we actually go out in the field, sorry, that thing should go. This, this is, um, again, another example of Mike Fulton running an RCVM demo. Let me just get rid of that window here. Do you want me to reshare? Um, uh, okay, so let, let this slide run around and I'll, I'll talk about this as I try to reshare the screen. Um, it is gonna go on the wrong window. I do not like why that's doing that, but I'll try. Actually, you know what? Instead of um, instead of doing the um, doing it that way, I'm just going to share the entire desktop. How's that? If that lets me do it, yeah, maybe it'll do it. Yes. Okay. Is that working? Oh, you're seeing the presenter view. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh no, that's not good. <laughs> uh, let Let me do the right thing. I'm sorry. This is a little bit jittery for some reason or the other. Oh, that, the reason is that it goes into the wrong window and I can't find my mouse after that. Oh, there it is. So desktop one or desktop two? Desktop two is, should be the one I share, sorry. There we go, now it's better. Okay, so this is, while this was all happening, this technical difficulty, you know, we can do underwater robots, but Zoom share, oh my God. Um, this is the robot trying to do follow me in the RCVM key names, like telling the person to follow. There's two things to note here. A, the robot's actually not quite mimicking what you saw in, in simulation. Not at all, right? It's doing something which is kind of still similar to what follow me gesture would look like, but it's not quite doing it the same way. B, the person holding the camera, yours truly, is trying to stay stable in the middle of a very rough sea. So my perspective is going up and down, which is also ruining your perspective of what the robot is really doing, because you can't stay still and say, oh yeah, let's do this. You can't. Station keeping underwater is a big challenge. So again, reality versus simulation, Massive gap, and unless you see these things in real life, you can't really bridge that gap. So that's the lesson that I wanted to point out. Um, tools that we use, this is local, um, the low cost open source autonomous robot that we created in the lab. This is very much a, a true lab spirit collective effort. All of this, by the way, is released open source, meaning the design and the code. So if you are so inclined, you can buy everything and make your own local. Nobody's gonna sue you for this. This is designed to be um, what we call lowering the barrier of entry to underwater robots. So as I asked you guys, uh, Minibot as a $100,000 device. Guess how much this is? Not that cheap, sorry. But close enough. Four digits, thousands. Four. Four thousand bucks. And that's actually modular. So you can buy, you can build a version of this for two and a half to three thousand bucks. Um, we've used high-end cameras. The, the two cameras that we're using right now are both combined over $1,000 worth. So if you want to use like Raspberry Pi cameras, you save 800 bucks right there. And there's modularity that's in, involved. We have a Jetson in there for deep learning. If you don't need it, just use a Raspberry Pi and that saves you 300 or 600 more bucks as well. So it's very modular in design. The whole details, like stuff like this, like how do you even solder the wires? These details are all on the website. And this was done solely by the students. So I'm, and Mike is one of the leaders, Kelsey did this, Jungsook is, I'm, I'm gonna miss people's names, but you know, all the PG students collaborated. I've had students from aerospace and undergrads, they came in and built this thing and it's truly a collective effort. It's been about two and a half years we've used this and it has held up um, massively well so far. And it's so easy and cheap to build that we have one right now. So we have Loco and hopefully soon enough we'll have Loco too. We would have had Loco too by now had it not been for this world that we're living in. Um, and it does really well. Uh, it does swim really well. I mean, this is our first local sea trials. Again, no tethers. Uh, we normally don't run tethers in the ocean. 
And it's kind of interesting because you can see the whole indoor insides of the robot because it's a um, acrylic plexiglass. And uh, it has the thrusters, unlike the minibot, which is flipper driven. So three thrusters, two of these tubes, they're interconnected by, via those um, potted cables. And it does onboard deep learning inference, human role interaction, uh, image enhancement, all of that is running on board this vehicle. Um, and depth capability goes down to about 150 meters um, because of the shell. And so far, so good. It's been running really reliably. So why buy a minibot? We can, we can buy 25 of these things in the price of one robot, right? So that's the kind of message. Um, I won't spend too much time talking. No, please don't crash again. Um, yeah, so there's something going on with these videos that makes it crash. Sorry, Ray, I'm gonna reshare. Re Actually, no, I don't need to reshare because you can see my uh, desktop here anyways. Um, so I'm gonna jump into the core of this just for the next slide. Why are we doing field trials? Why do we care about this so much? Uh, mostly because, well, not mostly, because we want to deploy our algorithms that we design in the, in the lab and deploy them on board physical robots and test them out in actual environments. In representative environments, that if somebody were to use our algorithms, where would they be using it? This is what we want to do this for. Uh, it's not just for lab settings, not just for controlled environments. Um, and it's also the harshest possible test for your software hardware integration and also the human interface systems. It is the ultimate validation. So if your robot gets back at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. To be honest, that always doesn't happen. And you'll see some example of that by the end of the slides. Um, and this is the first time that I'm actually even making this public that that happened. Um, a case study of this, where we often go, not often, but annually go, is the town of Whole Town in the west coast of Barbados. It's in, in the Caribbean. People who play cricket would recognize the country for a fleet of legendary cricketers. And it's a religion out there, um, very much like the subcontinent. They will stop you on the van. To, so this is where Joel Garner used to grow up, that twin two yards. So that sort of Joel Garner, imagine like Babe Ruth in the Baseball Hall of Fame kind of a way. Um, it's a very small island, but they have a scientific center, and I'm talking about that in a second, but essentially what we do there is five days of experiments dawn to dusk. Um, one day we just have to decompress, literally, because we are not allowed to get on a plane 24 hours from when we dive. So you have to not dive for 24 hours before you get on a plane. Same problem, bends, because if you go up at altitude, you decompress, and that's not good. So you have to get the nitrogen out of your body. Um, that's what we're doing. And it's not just us, there's teams from six different universities, 40 plus grad students and professors of, uh, we, we go five or six of them. And these days, industry representatives, they also go because this is a burgeoning industry. They're looking at these things for lots of different purposes, rugged robots. So the place is called Bel Airs. Um, it's been there from the 1950s actually. And it was established as a marine biology research center, but then we are one of the non-biology people who actually use this center for actual water work. So lots of, it's like a barrack and dorm essentially, uh, right by the ocean um, with coral reefs close by. So it's a really nice test ground for men in robots. So this is a subset from the 2019 participants. I couldn't find the 2020 photos, but this is the 2019 participants. Uh, the kids are not, Props or not are they, you know, experimental uh, subjects? But a lot of these people that you're looking at, we had teams from MIT, Woods Hole, um, us, South, Car South Carolina, McGill, and um, I forget some. Oh yeah, ETH Zurich, who came down that year to run robots and all sorts of different robots. You can see like four of these aquas. That's ours. There's a Trident. There's a uh, robot boat over there from Dartmouth. Oh, Dartmouth came. Um, different sets of people come in with their equipment for exactly the same reasons we go capture information, collect data, validate human studies and all that stuff, and then sustain the entire year before you have to go back again. So this last trial we had was 2020. Uh, it is, however, a very Darwinian environment because if you don't know what you're expecting, you are going to get some really rude surprises. Uh, there is no second chances there because uh, it's not a lab that you're taking home or you can run back to. Uh, that is a real photo from one of our participants whose uh, hands were burned, third degree burns from a lithium battery explosion. So he's getting an ice pack to make his hands feel better. Uh, one of our screws, you can see this is ours, that's Minibot with the M on it, that's the signature, that's our guy. The screw got stuck uh, in the shell. So we had to hammer and chisel the screw out of our $100,000 robot. Not what you want to see, that, but we had to do this. And this is why we do not use tethers. The fiber optic tether got so tangled up 
Um, and this is also a true story. And this is Mike. Some of you guys have seen him in your TS sessions for this class. Um, so there was a, a bad seas, cable got wrapped up um, with a rock. I tried to risk like, untangle it, and I'm in the ocean. Mike is trying to protect me from the waves, but in a human being versus waves, waves always win. So wave hit Mike, Mike falls on me, I'm in a rock. So I'm literally between a rock and a hard place. And I had my entire leg from a knee down, like scrape, like somebody peeled it with a cheese grater. That's life and salt water. So yeah, um, this is the kind of robotics we do. And it's not just running deep learning through four GPUs, but going out there and facing it, like what it looks like. By the way, you want to go there, fine. You have to weigh everything to the pounds because otherwise your airline is going to rip you $150 extra bill for two pounds overweight. Uh, we can't take the lab. So everything has to be tightly packed. Everything has to be really nicely taken. We are weighing them right before the flight to make sure that it's right down to the weight. So this is very like non-scientific approach. Nobody writes about these things in your papers, but the papers that you see happen, happen because we do these things. Right. Um, these are the logistical issues. By the way, this is the flight that we were taking the last time around. We were leaving Minneapolis. This was the weather in Minneapolis, and we weren't even sure if we were actually going to make the flight. Anyway, you can't take bigger lithium batteries on the flight. You can't. It's, it might blow up. You can't take um, too much things. You may need, you might be worried about fragile equipment. The heat and humidity is going to be a real problem. Of course, human factors. People are going to be up there working forty hours. Not 40 hours, actually 40 hours in three days. And that's really hard working environments. But on the other hand, it's once a year opportunity to do your work uh, as we are seeing. So what do we look like? Um, when we went last time around, so this is the local robot in the case back end. And I'll point out what I'm, what I'm trying to show you guys right there. We opened the case after flying for you know, a few thousand miles, the backbone of the robot is cracked. The propeller mount is cracked. That's a 3D printed uh, part. So what do you do then? Because there are no 3D printers in Barbados, at least that we know of. Um, so we bought a spare. How do you know? Because we've had problems like this before, not with Loco, but with other robots. So you earn that, they never take one of anything. I mean, unfortunately there's only one minibot. We are not that rich, but we can get spare parts. And now we know how to even pack this better. We take this piece off, jam it with foam and then put it elsewhere. So this doesn't get, you know, shock impacts in the airline. I mean, they just essentially throw these bags with the fragile sticker on them right off the belt. And that's how these things happen. So here's first night, Michael and Chelsea, she's also a PhD student. Um, they're actually literally marrying a boxing that piece together. But we have a spare, but when you have a flat tire, you want to fix that flat. So that's what's happening. And then next day we're hitting the beach with both robots in the morning. Right, so there is no rest for the weary, essentially. We landed, had dinner, let's go open the pack up, let's fix everything, let's make sure things are ready. This is Friday night, this is Saturday morning, and we're ready. And you can see kind of the weather and the waves, not very robot friendly at this point in time, but we're doing it anyways. So some of these sea deployment scenarios, um, on the left, you can see the kind of sand and grit that you see on these robot parts. Um, Mike and Jahid deploying robots from, uh, about to deploy Minibot, this is somewhere us, that's Mike, this is me, and Jahid had a heat stroke, unfortunately, because he was out there um, right under the sun and working without actually taking proper precautions. So he basically took my towel, wetted it, and then put it on his head and still kept working uh, without you know, completely disregarding what I said. I said, just go home and lie down. He's like, no, I'm okay. So he threw up a few times, but he was still there. Um, deployment scenarios, this, this picture is actually interesting. You've seen a version of this already. That was a human study. Some people might know what that is. In human computer interaction, you do protocol design, interaction design, and then you have a survey, or you send a subset of people say, okay, here's what we're trying to do. Please do this, and then ask a questionnaire, ask a set of questions later on to understand whether the method that you proposed worked or not. This is a human study done at 65 feet of water depth to extract gesture preferences. So um, this person, Jim Zacker, he's holding a notebook right here. That actually has instructions. So instructions are, please tell the robot to go left. He's using his right hand to say, go left. Normally what we do is go left and go right, but then he's using one hand to both say right versus left. Why are we doing this? This data is being used right now to create what we call a one-shot gesture learning system. 
So your gestures is gonna be different from Ray's gestures to different from my gestures, but the robot needs to understand all of these, that this is left, that's left, that's left. We're trying to extract this information from these people. These are people who actually work with robots, underwater robots with experience from them from this user study from two years ago. And this data is being used as I speak right now. So 2019 data doesn't mean that it's gonna be used in 2019. It will have a longer leg. So that's one of the points that I'm going to make here as well. By the way, um, you've seen some of these ocean trials and some of the, this is the pictures of the day we deploy. This is how the work environment looks like. And there are at least four of these minibot robots Lots of Pelican cases, lots of tools and everything. Everything gets mixed up with everything. So that's why if ever somebody's in our, in our lab, you'll see every tool has a sticker with our lab names on it, lab's name on it, because we lost pieces. If somebody took our tools and we never got them back. And it's really hard to tell which is whose, right? Because it's very confusing. Um, yeah, so unfortunately some people do, uh, in, I, I'd say not proper method, proper precautions, because when you have robots and equipment like that, please don't bring your beverages right close to it. Uh, that's, this is how not to do field robotics bench testing. Beverages, keep them far away when your robots open out there. Here's a day in the, in the field. So this is Mike, uh, Kim is videotaping because we need the data on the external camera for hand gesture based robot control and robot communication via motion, the key names that I showed you. So this is the top down view of the world. So obviously we had a, flying robot overhead um, trying to, and I'm the one trying to guide this. That's my apologies for not having the robot in the scene, but you'll see in a second, there's the robot swimming right back in. And um, again, operated tetherless. Mike is behind it, so it doesn't go to Venezuela just to make sure that we don't lose the robot. That's why we have two people in there. Um, and Kim is right there trying to videotape. And the other gentleman who just showed up is one of the industry reps. He's very interested in knowing what we are doing. So he's just following around for the fun of it. But this is sort of the environment that we're working in for six, seven hours a day. And not each of these people, like we take shifts. So it's Mike and Kim this time, next time me and somebody else, maybe Chelsea and I will go down and, and do the next set of experiments. But this can get really tiring really soon, um, but no other way to do it. And that's how we do it. Not everything goes according to plan, however. Um, and that's just the, uh, just the way it works. Uh, I'm going to re-slide re this again. I, I think the videos are not uh, playing nice for some reason, but we're almost at the end, so won't bo bother you too much. So this is the uh, robot communication, not the robot communication. You saw this video a few minutes ago, the picture of the humans in a loop. So this is the end of the experiment. We're coming back from the ocean, experiment's done. The drone is also coming back because we need these pictures for the paper that we're going to write. You can see the coral reef in the background. Um, we are drones going up just to put things to context. At this point, what you don't know is the battery low alarm goes off and the operator said, okay, come back home without changing altitude. So you'll see what happens. Yeah. So uh, there's a tree and there's a drone and drones and trees don't go well together. So what happened was drones trying to land, but it can't find anything. And you get a beautiful view of the ocean and the workspace and it got stuck. And it is still there. Yeah. So um, this is one of those things that every grad student in field robotics has to live with. I'm not gonna say who it was, but the person in question here is going to be forever known as the, you know, the drone destroyer. It was not their fault. It was a panic point because they thought, oh, better bring it back before it falls in the water. So they forgot to lower it down and then hit go home. Instead, they hit go home. So it didn't do this and that. It went this and tried to do this, found a tree. Uh, by the way, that's a very fancy resort. We don't live there. That's $800 a night. Uh, they don't let us go anywhere near this thing. They're security people, all that. Apparently, Mick Jagger and Patrick Stewart stays there sometimes. That's what I've been, I've never seen either of them. But anyway, so this is a challenge. That robot hasn't come back. It unfortunately wasn't, fortunately, it wasn't very expensive. Um, but we did, so the reason we have this data is because this is the 720p version that was on my phone. The 4K version is still on the tree, I think. Um, we tried, um, we tried for three days to get um, a rescue mission mounted. 
we couldn't get it because there's a canopy. The trees are very thin on the top. So you can really climb up there and get it. And from the top, one of our other colleagues, they flew their drones on top of that. So drone to drone rescue, that's a really nice project if anybody's interested in doing that. So they flew a drone on top, trying to look down to find this, this drone. So that drone could fit that drones. So at this point, I said, that's a great idea. This is gonna get both drones stuck on the tree. So maybe not try that. Uh, at one point, people are throwing like football at the tree just in case it knocks it down, but we haven't been able to get it down. It's, I'm guessing it's still there or it has crashed since because of the storms and everything else. So you know, as I said, it doesn't always work out. So what are we doing here in the lab? We're trying to get human robot interaction and collaboration running with autonomous robots on robot sensing and reasoning tools. We build systems. Thankfully the drone wasn't ours, but we do build robots based on our experience and our needs. Um, we do have code that's out there. Also, we have some data sets that I didn't talk about. Again, go to the lab page, there's a resources tab. You'll see what we have. It's all big data sets small data sets, lots of different code, machine learning code, and robot designs, all there. Um, and we like to do that last thing a lot. I mean, I like to do it, and the people who work with me, they are with me on this one because they also like to do the same things. It is a bit of a pain and suffering, but on the other hand, you, you can't go wrong by saying, hey, look at this, that's a robot's car, right? That gives you free drinks if you are into that sort of stuff. I mean. I'm half joking, but that really gives you the skills and the credentials to say, I know what field robotics is like. Um, there is no replacement. Some of these things that you've seen are like snapshots of pictures. The point of showing these things is like, yes, it's great to do these things in theory and in the field, um, in, in the labs, but unless you make that extra effort to make things work in the field environments, whether it's an underwater world or in an agricultural farm, or even in a bridge inspection, actually down on the I-35 bridge, you don't really know if this is gonna work or not. You don't really always have that appreciation of the factors that might play in. So what are we doing these days? Uh, there's lots of stuff that's happening. This is stuff that we aren't um, talking about in the lab websites, but one of our biggest gripes is that these deep detector systems, deep learning things in general, are often super confident about being wrong. Um, and we want to know how to figure those things out. We want to see if we can have a common language for robot and humans to understand so that we can have multi-human robot teams. Uh, we don't like labeling. I'm sure nobody does, but if you want to do deep learning, you've got to label. So how do you not do labels? So zero short learning, unsupervised learning, we're looking into things that we can, what we can use. We're doing image enhancement, yes, but we're not asking why. What are we going to do with those enhanced images? So that's something that we've been looking at for a while. That's actually Kelsey Edge, our PGC, that's our work. Um, Mike Fulton is looking at choosing what sort of robot to human communication method should be used, considering the context and the environment. Um, I talked about the user choice gestures that we just talked about, about the data set, the human study that we did. Also understanding what divers are doing and underwater object semantics. These are just a few snapshots. There's a whole lot of interesting problems going on in this space, which are really close um, parallels, which have close parallels with robotic problems in the field in other domains as well. So all that you've been looking at, subset of the people that have contributed to the work that you've seen today. I'm in here somewhere, but I've been fortunate to have grad students, undergrads, high school volunteers for that matter, who have not hesitated to go to jump right after me in these lakes um, and these oceans and these rivers to get the work done and have those papers that you've seen and the code that you've seen or will be seeing. So big thanks to the folks that you're looking at right now. Where are we? We're in 150 Shepherd. Uh, that's my email, that's my website. It goes to the CS page essentially. Um, the lab website is there. We also have a Twitter handle and a YouTube page. So we're very social, yeah, maybe. Um, and these are people that we have collaborated with, people who funded our research. And we're very thankful for all the work that um, we've gotten through them. So I'm gonna stop now. Um, we have five minutes to go for the session. So thank you so much for your attention and you know, going through the technical difficulties that we had to go through. I'm happy to take questions or criticisms. Either way. Um, I have one. So I'm um, I make an ask. Can you design a robot to avoid wildlife? Um, how do you measure not uh, fish or fish, for example? Uh, we don't. Uh, we uh, but the, the thing is there are obstacle avoidance algorithms on board the robots, but we do not explicitly design robots that can be not eaten by great white sharks or something like that. There isn't any of this because the thing is these robots are supposed to be with people for the most part. So if there is a shark in the water, the robot and the human should not, in neither of them, should be very near that shark at this point. 
Um, there is no design process that goes on into saying shark proof this robot. We, we haven't done that. Um, depending on the robot though, like the Minibot robot is what we call a biomimetic platform. It moves in a very biological manner. Actually, when it walks, it walks like a cockroach. It was designed on purpose like that. So three, it's a tripod gate, like the same way a cockroach walks. It's a bit of a creepy idea to keep in mind, but that's how it, it does walk. And uh, we've seen turtles and other fish not mind this at all. Um, we have a video, which I don't have the time to show, where this uh, minibot, a previous generation of the minibot, encounters a lobster out on the coast of Maine. And the lobster really thinks at the beginning that it's one of their own until it feels the robot and says, oh, that's too hard. That doesn't look like one of mine. And then it goes into a confrontational state. So um, what I'm trying to say here is, yes, we don't, we don't design robots to be not eaten. Uh, we don't... Um, have any problems so far, thankfully, but on the other hand, um, depending on the way the robot moves, it could be blending right in into these biological entities or sometimes it could be just sticking right out. So both of these are possibilities. Yes. Yes and no. Uh, yes, because in, it depends on the, so, if you're doing experiments in the middle of an area where there's a runoff of some sort, even the oceans can be super murky. Um, Great Lakes are not that, so in comparison, if we think about Great Lakes, let's say Lake Superior versus um, Lake Minnetonka. Minnetonka is way murkier than Lake Superior. Um, we can do things in those lakes as well. The challenge is that to use our um, image enhancement algorithms, we need data from those circumstances, so from, from those environments. That's the general deep learning problem. If you want to make things more generalizable, you need to have a wide variety of data sets. Right now, most of our data sets come from lakes here and the oceans in Barbados. We haven't been to Lake Superior yet. We were supposed to go last summer and obviously that went out of the window, but hopefully one of these days, um, not these days because it's getting colder, but hopefully next summer and early in the next summer, we will actually go out for a mission and capture some of this data that we need and hopefully that'll work. Sure, absolutely. Right, um, so the water quality and the visibility and, and the murkiness, turbidity, all of those things depend on the surround, the, the specific ecosystem that we're looking at. What contributes to this? So Gulf of Mexico um, might have BP oil leaks still. I'm hoping not, but you know, it's a very polluted environment as opposed to, and it's an ocean environment, by the way, tropical area, tropical waters, warmer waters. Lake Superior is not that. Uh, the plantation and the vegetation in lakes, the flora and fauna essentially is gonna be very different from what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico. So the differences would be, there's two ways to look at this. One is I, treat, uh, I teach a machine learning algorithm with these sort of different examples and say, this is dark, but this is, this, is, this is dirty water, this is clear water. Or I can try to mim uh, mimic the optics, the physics of light going through these and solve that really difficult nonlinear function that maps the inverse problem. So there's, there's both camps of image enhancement going on. We are on the machine learning camp because we know that better. Um, and it's hopefully, and not hopefully, but for our purposes, it has generalized well. But as I said, if you go to Lake Superior and if it's drastically very different from the Gulf of Mexico, we don't know that yet, then our algorithms may not generalize. So if to go somewhere or in, so Gulf of Mexico versus the Caribbean Sea should be similar. Hawaii should be similar. But you know, Lake Minnetonka versus the Gulf of Mexico, very different. So that's what we're trying to understand. Yes. So we have a project that's kind of dormant right now. It's called Dive. Uh, it's a bit of a very dormant project. And now, so Dive is not a robot per se, because it does, so it's, it's, a, it's an abbreviation. It's a, it's a circle abbreviation. It stands for Diving with Inflation Variance Engine. So it goes up and down. It's for long-term monitoring of ecosystems. So the plan of this is Loco carries Dive and drops it and just sinks right on the bottom and stays there with its tripod legs for a week, low power consumption, salience detection. So when something happens, it wakes up, captures some data, goes back to sleep. And then when it's close to being, oh, my battery is about to die, 
it has this mating collar on the neck that just it's a cycle it's a tube essentially a bicycle tube which inflates that with dry ice and gets light it comes right up and then local goes and grabs it and brings it back to the show so that's what we were working on right now we have a bit of a work done um, but right now we don't have a person who says i want to do that full time right now uh, nobody's thesis nobody's research projects are actually quite aligned with dive um, again that's another thing that got hurt because of covid because we were supposed to work with our colleagues in CFAN um, on deploying dive in St. Croix in the river to monitor, uh, not zebra mussels, but in this, not in this, uh, um, rare species of mussels. And of course, that didn't happen. So therefore, the robot platform hasn't gotten much love. Sure. That's a good point. So we have, um, what we're trying to do is have a low profile and wider uh, footprint not narrow and thin so we have two different versions of the drawing board on the drawing board we, we haven't built the second version yet which is the flatter one but um the point is that they have uh, spiky legs that digs into the river um, mud and also have them spread out wide and also have a bottom that's heavy and so it just drops down and then anchors it so we we, we don't have any active buoyancy control other than the the mating collar or the floating collar essentially um to keep them in space and if you know where to drop them behind a rock or the places that you want to really observe they're usually places where you can go as a human being because they are shielded through underwater structures so that's what we want to drop them uh, but that's another problem that unless we do this we won't really understand what we need to do so that's a very good point actually uh, we might have to have a dead weight we might have to jettison that when we have to come up right that's another idea but I, I, we don't know that yet yeah tell him We have, we, we have, uh, we have used them. The problem with that is, um, well, not a problem always. It's usually these documentaries are like, so for example, there's a documentary from, not a documentary, but this gentleman who dives off the coast of Bali to, to show that what tourists are doing to the sea. There's lots of plastic and garbage floating around. We actually trained our garbage detector on that. So we've already done that. Um, depending on the camera depending on the footage what sort of stuff that you get yes absolutely youtube and other sources as long as their creative commons attribute they don't mind yes we can use them for sure but then then the other question is if we're trying to for example the diver detection algorithms if you want to follow people if you want to predict people that's something we didn't talk about we're doing diver prediction these days uh, where is this diver going to go like future lstm kind of a work right um, long short-term memory recurrent networks um, for that purpose then we need footage of divers swimming from a robot's perspective. So that's another point of view I'm gonna bring in. Like if you take a data set like Coco, Coco is not taking with a robot sitting right here. Coco sitting on data set that you guys have taken with your smartphones, pictures, pictures, pictures. Robots don't look at the world like that. So the, the things that you're looking at, the, the learning that's happening is implicitly biased for that perspective. My robot is down there and it's looking up like that with really googly eyes and it's not seeing what Coco is teaching it to see. And it can be shown that these data sets, however great they are, and they are great, by the way, for a lot of vision tasks, they do not always scale up for computer vision tasks, um, for robot vision tasks. So I'm gonna separate those two things. Robot vision is when things are running onboard robots. I don't have a backend cluster with 80,000 80, GPUs helping me out. It's right there on that robot, on that Jetson, maybe, that's it. And that's what we're trying to do, mostly. You know, Janine, the great seminar, I really enjoyed it, uh, the talk. Thank you. I have a quick a general question. You know, if you wanted to um, use these robots for um, mapping, um, how would you do things like uh, finding the, the position of the robot and measuring distances to objects and things like that? Great question. So I, I didn't at all. Um, so the question was that if we want to use these robots for mapping, how are you going to see distances or locations localizing these robots? So in our lab, what we're doing is um, using stereo pairs, but not actually doing stereo camera vision. So not, not using two cameras for, or I see one, um, one object with the right eye, other same object with the left eye, and then trying to match them. Instead of doing that, what we're using is one camera for what no, what's known as monocular visual odometry. And the other camera is adjusting for scale because what scale is that if I take my thumb out in direction in front of someone's head and say, oh yeah, my thumb is as big as your head. That's obviously not the right scale. 
And to adjust for that scale, once when the robot knows how much it has actually traversed, the scale adjustment tells it, okay, you thought you went one feet, but actually you went six inches. So we have an algorithm called scale Opt optimized visual odometry that we worked on, and this is actually published code and it's running in the lab. We combine that with something called place recognition. So the robot knows that I've been here before. And then you add um, IMU integration, initial measurement unit integration, so that in the turbidity, uh, not the turbidity, in the, in the turbulent waters, because the robot's moving sideways up and down in a very unpredictable manner, you can combine both vision, both IMU information, and also overall place recognition algorithm to do full loop closed slam. And that is actually something that we're doing as I speak. The distance measurement system, you have to use actual stereo if you can, because a sonar gives you some, but that's an active sensor. The reason we don't use active sensors is because A, it's high energy, it takes up a lot of battery. And B, if you're doing a marine life inspection or uh, some kind of marine biological work with these robots, and that's where our inspiration comes from, sending high pulse uh, or high energy pulses in the water is not going to help those uh, missions because the fish is gonna get scared, the animals are gonna run away, and we're not gonna get the right data that we want to get. Um, but sonar still doesn't give you the exact accuracies that you're looking for. So when we talk about localization, this is not localization in a grand scale that we're going to localize in a kilometer. This is not going to work for that. But if you were talking about um, 200 meter area between different coral reefs, the robot goes from one reef to the other or one rock to the other and then comes back to you, then these things will work as long as the robot is close to the bottom um, and it can see the bottom. So combining with our image enhancement algorithms, we pass it to the to the visual odometry and the slam algorithms then these things will give you the results that you're looking for okay okay and uh, gps is not really going to be available to the robot right it's not going to be able no to get signal. no okay. not underwater okay thank you you're welcome awesome yeah we're about 10 minutes extra Okay. Well, I think in that case, everybody uh, have a fantastic weekend, and we'll see you next week. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me.